Okay, this final genetics lecture is going to cover some kind of uh, additional information, makes genetics just a little more complicated. We'll cover probability, we'll cover two different types of dominance inheritance, sex linked inheritance, and pedigrees. So, genetics and making a Punnett square is all about predictions. What's the probability? that I could have an offspring with certain traits. Remember, probability does not equal reality in the sense that just because you're predicted, like here, to have one homozygous recessive child and three children expressing the dominant allele, doesn't mean if you have four kids, it's going to happen like that, right? Every, <clears throat> every pregnancy is a new Punnett square. Because every egg or every sperm had the chance to make any combination of gametes, so it doesn't kind of carry over. So probability, <clears throat> um, we use the Punnett square and we're looking at the probability of offspring genotypes or phenotypes, whichever you might be asked for. And <clears throat> primarily we use fractions, especially if we have a probability problem where we're looking at multiple probabilities. It's much easier than trying to oh, I'm sorry, I can't talk and write, especially with multiple probabilities. Fractions are much easier to add or multiply than, say, decimals. But sometimes things are represented as a percent. So with this Punnett square, you could say that you have 25% chance, 1 in 4, of having homozygous recessive offspring. <clears throat> or looking at this one, uh, or you would have, you know, 75% or three-fourths showing the dominant trait. But most of the time when you do probability questions for this class, <clears throat> you're going to be looking at multiple probabilities, so you want to use fractions. So, <clears throat> There are two probability rules. It's the product rule. And we have the addition rule. And the keywords you're going to look for in the product rule, the keyword is and. What's the chance of having this and that, or maybe all, or both? Okay. The keyword here is or. What's the chance of this or that happening? So if you have an or in your story problem, you're going to add the probabilities. And if you have something that's talking about and all, but all, sorry, <laughs> both, everything happening at, this, at, at once, you're going to multiply the individual probabilities. So let's try a problem. Tongue willing is a dominant trait. What is the probability that these parents, one is heterozygous for tongue rolling, rolling 
when the other cannot roll their tongue. So if tongue rolling is a dominant trait, we're going to represent it by a capital T. That means a non-roller is going to be represented by a little t. So we've got parents. One's heterozygous, so we know that's big T, little t. And the other one cannot roll their tongue, so they're little t, little t. And they will have two children that can both roll their tongues. So that's telling you we're going to multiply probabilities. So if we figured out the gametes, T, and this one is, ugh, my pen's not working today. Little t, and we made our punnet square or rectangle because I'm only going to use the unique gametes. We get, no, wait, what? We get <clears throat> these two possible offspring, a tongue roller and a non-roller. And so the question says, what's the chance that they'll have two, two children that can both roll their tongues? Well, you have one half chance of getting a roller, one half chance of getting a non-roller. So if you have two kids, both roll their tongues, you would take one half times one half, and the chance that that would happen would be one fourth. Okay, so that's the probability. You got a half a chance that the first one has it, and you got a half a chance that the second one has it, and you combine those probabilities, and you get one fourth that you would have two children that could both roll their tongues. On the flip side, you could have the addition rule. So we have the same parents, same Punnett square as before, but a different question. So here the question is, what's the probability that they will have a child that is heterozygous or homozygous dominant? Okay, so this is an addition. So that you want to know if you're going to have this or homozygous dominant this. And so again we look at our Punnett square and the chance that you have heterozygous is one half. The chance that you have a homozygous dominant if you look at the Punnett square is zero. So they have one half of the chance of having a child that is heterozygous or homozygous dominant. Okay. So let's do a couple other problems. All right, the male woman is albino, and the father-to-be is heterozygous. What is their chance of having an albino child? So this is just a simple one, and I tell you that albino is recessive. So let's use A, the male woman is albino, so she must be homozygous recessive. The father is heterozygous. So if we do our Punnett square, looks just like the one we did before. What is their chance of having an albino child? Well, homozygous recessive is albino, so their chance is one half. Okay. Based on the Punnett square below, what is the chance that this couple will have two albino children? Okay, so now we actually had a um, monohybrid cross. We have big A, little a cross big A, little a. And we see the chance of having an albino child is one out of four. One out of one, two, three, four. And then you want to know two. So that means they're happening at the same. You don't have an or in there. So you go one fourth times one fourth is 1 16th. So just think about this. The problem of two events happening 
is lower than one event or another event happening. So that's why we use the product rule. Okay. Let's do one more. Same Punnett square. What is the chance that this couple will have an albino child or a homozygous dominant? All right. So now we have or, so we're going to do addition. So the chance of an albino child is one-fourth. The chance of homozygous dominant is one-fourth. So we say one-fourth plus one-fourth equals one-half. So they have a 50% chance of having a child that is either this genotype or this genotype. So again, keeping probabilities in fractions makes it easier if you're having to apply the um, uh, multiplication or addition rule for probability. All right, two other types of inheritance. So we have been working with plain old dominant recessive. One dominant allele gives the dominant phenotype. But there's two other types that can happen, and <clears throat> they're incomplete dominance and co-dominance. And we're going to write the um, alleles a little bit different for these. So what I want you to see here is that incomplete dominance results in a blend of the mother and father phenotype. Right? So red plus white equals pink. So incomplete dominance is a blend. Codominance means both characteristics are expressed. So we have a cow with white hair and with red hair, and what we get is a cow with called roan, which is red and white. So we don't have a pink cow. So let's talk about how we write these gametes. So for incomplete dominance and for codominance for this class, we are going to use superscripts. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm using two capital letters because there's not a dominant recessive um, interaction here. They're both kind of dominant. And so we're going to say, let me write this over here. If you are homozygous for C superscript R, your flowers are going to be red. And if you're homozygous for C superscript W, your flowers are going to be white. And if you're heterozygous, which means you have one of each allele, your flowers are going to be pink. Okay, So the way you tell that it's incomplete dominance is you look at the heterozygote. And that's true for pure dominant recessive, right? If you look at the heterozygote, it's showing you the dominant trait. So that means this gene or this allele, this yeah, gene is inherited in the regular dominant recessive fashion. If you look at the heterozygote here, you see it's a blend of the two parents. That's incomplete dominance. Codominance, we're going to write things the same way, but the heterozygote shows both traits. So that's co, both. Both traits are seen. So you can't tell up here if it's codominance or incomplete dominance. You have to look at the heterozygote. Sometimes this is just an FYI in case you're going out practicing problems. Some places will, or books, will write W, W is white, and RR is red, and so WR is the roan color. Okay. 
We're not going to use this because I think it teaches you some bad habits, especially when you're first learning genetics. So we're going to stick to one letter to represent the gene, and then we're going to use superscripts to represent the alleles. Okay, another type of inheritance. So everything we've talked about so far, we've been talking about things on the autosomes, right? So remember you have chromosome pairs, one through 22 are called autosomes. And then your 23rd pair are your sex chromosomes. So that's your X or your Y. When we do sex-linked traits, we are talking about traits on the X chromosome. Okay, we're not going to put anything on the Y chromosome. You need to remember that males are XY and females are XX. And so now, when we keep track of the traits, we're going to put them as superscripts on the X chromosome. So this is just to show you a little bit of the difference. So you cannot live without an X chromosome. So if you could zoom in there, which I never can get it to do when I want it to, you would see all of these genes that are important for life. 153 million base pairs. The Y is about one third that size, only 50 million base pairs. And what's most important on the Y is the SRY region which has all the male genes. So if you have the SRY region, you are going to be physically male. Okay. All males have X's and females have two X's. So when you put um, information about sex linked genes, they follow the same dominant recessive inheritance. Okay. So we'll be using same letter, like capital N, lowercase n. You must write the allele on the X chromosome, and only the X. The Y does not carry these genes. Okay. So when you're making gametes, you do the same thing, you follow the same rules of splitting um, the chromosomes. And then what this adds to is the phenotype for this trait now includes sex the um, sex information. So you might have a question that says, for the boys or for the girls, or you might have one for all children. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, I want to make sure I put some examples. So just so you know, here are some real life examples of sex link traits, and they can be recessive or they can be dominant. I will tell you if it's a sex-linked trait. Okay. I will tell you if it's a sex-linked trait. So if I don't say it's either X-linked or sex-linked, then it's not. Okay, so don't think if I, you know, give some kind of uh, 
characteristic that you think, oh, well, that's for guys. So I'm going to put it, you know, as a sex link trait. Don't do that. I will tell you which ones are sex linked. So let's try an example. Red green color blindness is an X linked trait. It is recessive. What is the, what is the phenotypic? I should say what are the phenotypic ratios from a normal father and a carrier mother? Okay, father is X, Y, mother is X, X. So we're going to say red green color blindness is X linked trait and it's recessive. So if you are colorblind, it's recessive, so it's going to be a little c, and that means big C is normal vision. So the father is normal, and he actually can only have, let me put an underline under there, one allele, because he only has one X chromosome. The mom is a carrier, and we know that carrier means heterozygous. So what you do is you give your mom a big C and a little c. Okay, so we got to do the same kind of Punnett square. So dad has big C and Y gametes. And mom has big C and little c gametes. And when we combine them, we get X big C, Y, and X, little c. See, I told you, the things will no longer look big and little. <laughs> y, and we get X, big C, X, big C, and we get X, big C, X, little c. So just for fun, let's assign phenotypes. Okay because we want the phenotypic ratios. So this boy, we have a boy with normal vision. And over here, we have a boy who's colorblind. Here, because this is dominant recessive, we have a girl with normal vision, because she has a dominant allele and normal is dominant. And over here, we have a girl with normal vision. So what's the answer? Well, it's not that all children have normal vision because we have a colorblind boy here. And it's not a three to one normal to colorblind, even though, yes, there's three normal to one colorblind, you must add in the sex of the child. That's a characteristic. All females are normal, all males are colorblind. No, we have a normal boy. So it's a two to one to one ratio. And remember I told you, you have to always state what those ratios mean. So we have two normal females. We have one normal male and one colorblind male. So the key is keeping those, um, what do you call it? <laughs> keeping those alleles on the X chromosome and keeping track of the sex of the children. All right, I've got one more. Red green colorblindness is X linked, it's recessive. What's the probability that a normal father and a colorblind mother would have a daughter? with color blindness. Okay. So this is what was the mom? Oh the mom was a carrier, so we gotta do a new one. Okay. Normal dad, X big C Y. Oh no, it's the same. Sorry. Carrier mom. Good, I thought I had done the same. So <laughs> it's the same Punnett squares we used here. And we want to know a daughter with color blindness. So if we look up here, we've got a girl normal, a girl normal. We have no girls with color blindness, so the answer is zero. 
what is the probability that, let's do a different one, that they would have, um, here's another way we can say this, of the sons, what's the probability of having a colorblind son? So if you see of the sons, then you just look at boys or males. And if we go back here, right, we have either a boy with normal vision or a boy with colorblind vision. And so the answer would be one half because half of the males, boys, would be colorblind based on our predictions. Okay, so do you see the difference of the sons? You only look at the males. If it said just a son with colorblind, we would go back here and we'd say, okay, to have a son that's colorblind, you have one fourth because you're putting in this extra um, um, kind of characteristic of it of the child being male. Okay, a few more slides. Term to know, norm of reaction. This means <clears throat> that things can be genetically identical, but they can have different phenotypes. And this is when the environment plays a role. So you can actually have what norm of reaction means. It's, it's a norm or it's, it's the spread of possible phenotypes with that specific genotype. Okay, so if you planted, this is my drawings, of identical plants, right? but then some got more sunshine than others, they might grow taller. Or here it's showing you at warm temperatures. So you can have things that are genetically identical that don't look identical. And that's to the, due to the influence of the environment. Oh, norm of reaction, that's what I was trying to say. Kind of like the range of phenotypes based on a single genotype. I mentioned way when we first started genetics that most genes, most traits are not, um, come on brain, most traits are not determined by one gene. So most traits are polygenic, which means many genes give a single trait. Okay. So for instance, your skin color. If you looked around your classroom, you don't have just white or black, say, right? We have a whole range because there's many genes that are affecting that trait. And so all those different alleles interact to give you your physical appearance. Appearance. So we call this continuous variation, right? The variation goes along a whole spectrum because of this polygenic expression. Now, this part is showing you norm of reaction Because if you're in a sunnier place and out in the sun, you might increase your pigment, right? you might get a tan. And so you haven't changed your genetics, but the environment has affected your phenotype. So a couple of words to be um, familiar with and no, note that most genes or most traits are polygenic. Okay? It's not one, one gene, one trait but that's too complicated to try to figure out um, 
in basic genetics. Last concept <coughs> is a pedigree. Okay, a pedigree is following human generations and marking their traits. Okay, so a couple of things you need to remember. Males are represented by squares. Females are represented by circles. And if you fill in the square versus, we call this an open, we call this filled, they are affected. And affected just means they show the trait that you're studying. So affected doesn't have to be negative. We might be looking at a pedigree about height and we find that height is a dominant trait, so you're affected by your height. So affected just means you're showing the trait. The other things to look at is when we connect <clears throat> a square and a circle like this, it means they were mating, and then we usually draw a line, and this shows all their offspring. Okay, so remember the so symbols, remember what it means to be filled in, and you have two rules to learn. Okay, so here's a pedigree showing widow's peak. Okay, so widow's peak is when your hairline comes down a little bit. Right? So widow's peak is the trait. So affected means you have the widow's peak. Right, and your rule is, and I'm just going to tell you this is a dominant trait. Your rule is if every affected child has at least one affected parent, the trait is inherited in a dominant manner, right? So we look at the kids, and I always go from the bottom up, right? So this kid has widow's peak, and yes, they had at least one parent that was affected. And this affected child had an affected parent. And this affected child had an affected parent. And this affected child had an affected parent, right? So this is a inherited in a dominant fashion. What kind of genotypes could we tell? If I asked you to assign genotypes. Well, we know that any open circle or square is not affected. And since this is dominant, it means they're recessive. So um, if we're gonna use W, all of these guys are little w's, right? And this parent had to be, this mom had to be big w, little w, because she had to give a little w to this kid, but she had to give a big w to this kid, right? So now you can start to see how the parents, <coughs> um, oops, genotypes were passed down. And so you could go through, and I would go through with practicing, and there's some people you may not know. Okay, we know this guy, because there's two little w's, but we don't know if this child is WW or big W, little w. So this shows um, the um, genotypes and you need to be able to figure out how it's inherited, dominant or recessive, and we'll look at recessive in a second, and then be able to assign genotypes. What about with humans? Okay. If, here's your second rule, if any affected child has two unaffected parents, 
the trait is her inherited recessive. Okay? Because that means you've got two carriers that all of a sudden the recessive showed up. And that's shown right here. This child is affected, affected with an attached earlobe. Parents were not. So, or what letter do they use here? We'll use F. Okay. I'm gonna use A, I don't care. Okay. So, any, doesn't mean all, right? Any affected child has two unaffected parents, it has to be recessive. And again, practice assigning genotypes. There's the answer. You should be able to fill that chart in. So, quick question. Is the following trait inherited in a dominant or recessive manner? So, as you go, remember, always work your way up. You should see that this child that's affected has two unaffected parents. So this is inherited in a dominant, I mean, this is inherited in a recessive manner. That's what you're looking for. All you need is one exception, one part of that rule. This one, if you look, every affected child has an affected parent, so it's dominant. Okay, so practice, 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 practice. Right. Our objectives were to determine probability, and we talked about the product and the addition rule. We talked about codominance, right? and incomplete dominance, and sex linkage or sex linked traits. We talked about the norm of reaction, and this is due to environment. We talked about polygenic, meaning multiple genes affect a trait and that usually results in continuous variation of how that trait looks. And we talked about pedigrees, and you know now how to read it if it's a dominant or recessive inheritance. Like I said, practice, 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 and that will help you with these concepts.